Okay, <coughs> so thanks for being here. Welcome to the third uh, uh, lecture. This is going to be about, uh, so in the past two lectures, essentially we discussed uh, the basic properties of dark matter and uh, um, the proof of the fact that it exists uh, in the universe. And now we're going to discuss uh, today, essentially, uh, two things. The first one is uh, how we think that dark matter has been produced in the early universe. And second, if I have time, and I think I will, at least in part, uh, we'll discuss some uh, broad, um, a broad overview of the candidates uh, of uh, particle physics candidates for dark matter, uh, with just main properties and not specific uh, theories. So, first of all, dark matter production. So, th essentially, uh, there are two things I have to say first. Uh, so, all the mechanisms that I'm going to discuss. Um, uh, so you remember that uh, we need dark matter to be there since uh, very early, so since the, say, essentially the beginning of the universe uh, down to today. Mm -hmm. So we need some mechanism that produces it uh, very early. With very early, I mean that for sure it must be before uh, uh, the CMB, because we have evidence that uh, dark matter exists at the time of the CMB. But most of the mechanisms that I'm going to discuss are actually in the much earlier universe. So at much uh, higher redshift or much uh, higher temperature, uh, temperatures as we will see. We will see. Second, uh, so all the mechanisms that I'm going to discuss assume uh, necessarily some uh, interaction between dark matter and ordinary matter. So essentially dark matter will be produced in one way or another uh, from the ther thermal buff of particles. So, well, I mean, this is one of the possibilities that are in general connected to the uh, standard, uh, to the ordinary matter. And so we are assuming that there is a connection between dark matter, there are interactions between dark matter and uh, uh, ordinary matter of some sort. <coughs> this is not necessarily required by cosmology. So we, we know that there are no evidences for this. Uh, all the evidence we discussed last week uh, and the week before are of gravitational interactions. So it could be that uh, other production mechanisms exist in which only gravitational interactions uh, are involved. This is not what I'm going to, going to discuss uh, today. Essentially, these are particle physics mechanisms that uh, involve uh, some kind of interaction between dark matter and ordinary matter. Okay, so I'm going to discuss, I think, the, the first uh, three of these, uh, the freeze-out mechanism or thermal relic uh, uh, production, the, the so-called uh, asymmetric dark matter production, and the so-called freeze-in uh, mechanism. I don't think I will have time to cover these uh, two mechanisms, so just a few words. Uh, Oscillations typically apply to, applies to the case of sterile neutrinos, which are a candidate of which I will talk a little bit uh, possibly next week. And I think they can be considered, it can be considered also in some sense uh, a subset uh, of the freezing, uh, the freezing mechanism. And the, the procedure, the, the mechanism of initial misalignment ap applies in particular, so this is uh, relevant for the uh, case of sterile neutrino dark matter. And uh, this one instead uh, applies essentially to the case of ultralight, uh, typically bosonic uh, particles. So for instance, uh, axions uh, and other uh, similar candidates. So I'm not going to discuss, uh, I guess, uh, this, uh, these two mechanisms. Between these three, among these three, it's fair to say that uh, the, the, the first one, so the freeze out uh, or thermal relic uh, mechanism, is by far the most popular. So I mean, uh, people in the past uh, decades uh, essentially consider this uh, as uh, the paradigm. So I'm going to spend more time on this uh, rather than this and this. It's uh, typical of, uh, partic of particle physics candidates such as uh, neutralinos in supersymmetry or uh, WIMPs in general, as, as I will discuss uh, later. So it has been very, very popular. Essentially, people consider it to be the truth in some way. These ones uh, are rather more recent, uh, not historically, but in terms of uh, uh, attention from the community, which doesn't mean that uh, this one is, uh, say, more uh, uh, appealing uh, than these ones, uh, or necessarily more valid than these ones. It's just that it has been considered for, for a longer time. OK, so let me move on uh, and discuss uh, uh, freeze out first, uh, or thermal relic. And I'm going to discuss to do it. Uh, so freeze out production and I'm going to do essentially in three steps first of all I'm going to give you some sort of a cartoon story of how the how the story goes and then uh, I will uh, show some semi-analytical semi shortcut to get uh, a reasonable answer 
of uh, the amount of dark matter that you get. And then I will sketch the detailed computation. So I will go through, through steps from the most uh, intuitive to the most uh, detailed without uh, going into the actual details. So the basic principle is the following. The basic idea is the following. The dark matter is a particle that has been produced abundantly in the early universe, mm, essentially from the thermal bath of particles uh, in the early universe. So it was uh, in equilibrium, in thermal equilibrium with everything else. And then at some point, uh, it's, it is left over. Mm. So what we observe today, the abundance of dark matter that we observe today, is a leftover of a much more abundant quantity that has been, had been produced uh, in the early universe. So suppose that I want to uh, follow the evolution of, uh, of the dark matter density as a function of uh, time, or if you want, uh, inverse temperature. So I'm I want to plot uh, the number density <coughs> of uh, dark matter particles that I will call uh, x, just to be a bit uh, faster, as uh, the universe uh, goes on. Mm -hmm. So essentially what I'm saying is that I will have uh, a very large amount in some uh, normalized units. I will be, be more precise later uh, in the early universe. And then evolution, and today we are left uh, with some uh, final residual value uh, left over as a thermal relic, as a relic uh, from the early universe. So the story is the following. Consider a, a, a particle that I call uh, X, mm, which has the, the following properties. So it's uh, subject to uh, annihilations. So I have a particle X and I have uh, an antiparticle X bar, which uh, annihilates in two anything uh, I can think of. For instance, let me say a uh, fermion-antifermion pair of the standard model. Mm -hmm. So annihilations uh, <coughs> uh, happen in this way, and of course also the inverse reaction can happen. I can uh, take two particles of the standard model, say an electron and a positron, and produce, uh, if the conditions are right, uh, x uh, and uh, x bar. Now let me suppose that uh, this particle is uh, heavy, for reasons that will be clear later. By heavy, I mean something, say, of the order of, uh, say, if you have to keep a number in mind, uh, 100 GV. Mm -hmm. So this can be 1 GV to 1 TV to 10 TV, but it doesn't matter. So of the order of 100 GV, roughly speaking. It's a particle which is stable, right? Uh, so doesn't decay away. Um, that's one of the uh, requirements, uh, the basic requirements for a dark matter particle, as we saw in the first uh, lecture. We are in uh, uh, an expanding universe. This is uh, certainly true. Although this is not particularly, this will not be particularly uh, relevant, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's to, kept in mind, to be kept in mind. And uh, I assume that this particle has a symmetric abundance, an initial symmetric abundance. Meaning that uh, the initial conditions are such that uh, x, uh, the number density, well, let's say, x uh, is uh, equal to x bar. So I have the same amount of particles uh, and uh, antiparticles as an initial condition. So at the beginning, uh, this particle, as I was saying, is part of the thermal bath. So in some units, uh, this will be, say, uh, 1. I mean, I will be more precise later what I mean by these uh, units. I say Nx, uh, the number density of particles Nx, normalized appropriately, is equal to, say, 1. Meaning, essentially, this particle is as abundant as everything else, as abundant as electrons, positrons, uh, uh, photons, uh, uh, quarks, antiquarks, uh, and so on and so forth. And that's because uh, these reactions uh, are efficient. So they can happen continuously in one direction and in the other. So I annihilate uh, dark matter particles away producing standard model fermions, but at the same time, uh, the bath uh, is energetic enough uh, that I can uh, annihilate, uh, say, electrons and positrons to produce uh, dark matter and dark matter pairs. So everything stays in equilibrium and I have the same, uh, the same abundance. <coughs> then at some point, uh, as the universe uh, expands, uh, you remember that the universe is expanding, uh, the temperature uh, lowers, so uh, things become uh, 
Uh, I mean, the, the, the thermal bath uh, has a, a lower temperature. And so at some point, uh, the inverse reaction will stop being efficient, uh, in the sense that uh, the temperature will not be enough. Uh, so, say, this reaction can still happen, annihilations can still happen. But uh, when the temperature is uh, of the order of the mass of the dark matter particle, I will not have enough, uh, or lower, I will not have enough uh, energy in the bath uh, to produce uh, the pair of dark matter particles, right? So this uh, inverse reaction uh, necessarily stops uh, because of simply kinematical reasons. I don't have enough energy in the bath to produce uh, massive uh, particles, uh, particles such as X. So at that point, uh, the abundance decreases uh, naturally because annihilations are still active, but uh, inverse reactions uh, are not, following an exponential decline, uh, which is uh, proportional to minus mass of dark matter particles divided by the temperature in, uh, in, uh, as a standard Boltzmann suppression term. So here I'm using the fact, indeed, that this is a heavy particle. And as the universe expands, uh, temperature cools down, uh, the universe cools down, and the energy is not sufficient any longer. Now, the universe uh, is still expanding under the feet uh, of this uh, particle here. So at some point, uh, even these reactions, uh, those of annihilation, will stop uh, being uh, efficient. Mm. And uh, instead of uh, decreasing uh, forever and ever, at some point, uh, the, uh, the, the abundance will uh, uh, stop, uh, will, uh, will be frozen indeed. And this is why this is called freeze out, uh, when essentially even these reactions uh, cannot happen any longer. So what I'm saying here is that at some point, uh, at this temperature that I can call a temperature of freeze out, uh, the universe is expanding so fast uh, that two dark matter particles, or rather a particle and an antiparticle, are not able to find each other any longer, because the universe is expanding much faster than uh, they than can, can keep up. Uh, and so their respective abundance is frozen, and nothing happens any longer. So this is the final abundance that I'm uh, uh, receiving uh, today <coughs> in terms of, uh, uh, this is today, in terms of dark matter particle. We have uh, a residual abundance of X plus X bar particles, which is indeed, as I was saying at the beginning, the sort of uh, leftover of an, an incomplete annihilation due to the fact uh, that the, expand the universe is expanding uh, and this particle cannot uh, fully disappear. Okay. So this is the basic story, and this is uh, the prediction for uh, the final abundance of dark matter. We start from thermal equilibrium, one in some units, uh, and we end up uh, with a final abundance, which is dictated by the processes that happen in the, in the meanwhile. <coughs> in particular, the crucial point is uh, this moment, uh, the moment of freeze out uh, that happens uh, at this temperature here, that, uh, well, actually, probably I should put it here. That happens, uh, that, uh, that, I mean, uh, uh, um, identifies the moment in which uh, annihilations also stop and everything remains constant, uh, for, uh, constant forever. Now, you might say this remains constant, but the universe is expanding, so the number density will dilute as one of the volume of the universe, as I said many times. Yes, OK, but this is because I'm normalizing this quantity here to factor out uh, the, 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 the expansion of the universe. Mm, so uh, let's say once uh, annihilation stops, one, once the uh, processes that uh, change the number of particles stop, uh, the rest is just a simple uh, dilution. And so I'm factoring this out, and what I have is a, is, is a constant. Yeah? Uh, is this uh, before biogenesis, or after there is no asymmetry between X and X bar? No. I'm assuming that this is a, a symmetric case, uh, so I have a symmetric abundance between X and X bar. It's before biogenesis, but typically yes, uh, but uh, yeah, this is, is completely disconnected, so I'm not connecting to, to, the, baryon to the physics of ba the baryonic sector at all. It will be in the next case that the two will be connected. But typically, yes, it's before. So we are talking about, as we will see later, temperatures which are of the order of, uh, say, a 20th of the mass of the dark matter particle. And so if, uh, if this is 100 GV, roughly we are talking about uh, 5 GV, roughly, eh? I mean, and while BBN happens at an MEV, 
this can change a lot, but typically, yeah. Um, when you put expanding universe in parentheses, it said that it wasn't so important. No, I, like it's, it's the main. Yeah, but in the sense, or I, mean, I put it in parentheses because what I'm plotting here is uh, uh, factoring out expansion of the universe. In sense. Uh, I mean, it's, it's real. No, I mean, the fact that it expands is important. But yeah. the parenthesis just uh, reminds you that in this kind of plot here, I'm not putting it in. Otherwise, if this would be really the number density, I would have uh, that uh, it goes down as 1 over a cube, or 1 over the volume, uh, even when nothing happens. Uh, and for simplicity of illustration, I'm not uh, plotting that. This is the only meaning of the parenthesis. Okay, so <coughs> the story, yeah. I think Tarek was talking about the biogenesis and not nutrosynthesis. So biogenesis. Ah, biogenesis. Yeah, asymmetry between F and F bar and maybe X X bar. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I messed up. I messed up. Uh, yeah, I don't know, actually. Yeah, it could be, I mean, you, you can have, I mean, these are the typical temperatures at which uh, we are considering this process to happen in the case of freeze out. Variogenesis, I mean, it's not necessarily connected to this. I don't know, I think about it and let you know. Okay, then uh, um, this is the cartoon. Should be, should be pretty clear. And, um, and what I want to do now is instead uh, to, um, to, to derive uh, in some way this uh, intuitively or say semi analytically with some uh, shortcuts and cheating. Uh, the final answer. So how much dark matter will I get from this kind of, uh, from this kind of process? So the crucial point is that uh, I have to find the moment in which uh, freeze out happens. Because if I have uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this instant in time, then as I was saying, uh, apart from the expansion, what I will get in the end is the final answer. So that moment in time essentially is identified the moment of freeze out is identified by the condition that the rate of uh, annihilations, so of the, cr of the uh, reactions, of this kind of reactions, uh, becomes uh, more or less of the same order as uh, Hubble, the, the rate of expansion of the universe. Because as I said, uh, this is the moment in which uh, the rate becomes uh, slow with respect to the expansion of the universe, so two particles don't find each other anymore and are not able to annihilate any longer. So I could put a mi less than, but roughly speaking, this is the moment I'm looking for. You can see it also in another way. So a rate uh, is uh, uh, proportional to the inverse uh, of the mean free path uh, of particles. Uh, and this is proportional to the size of the universe, uh, to the inverse of the size of the universe at that moment in time. So what I'm saying is that uh, as long as the mean free path of two particles uh, for this kind of annihilation becomes longer than uh, the size of the universe at that time, uh, annihilations don't happen any longer. A particle can travel for a distance which is longer than the size of the universe without uh, annihilating uh, with another particle. Mm -hmm. So this is the intuitive meaning of the condition that I'm imposing here. <coughs> so the rate uh, will be expressed uh, simply as, uh, let me put all twiggles here because these are right, uh, right just uh, estimates in some sense the number density of the particle x times uh, the annihilation cross-section. So the, the particle physics uh, uh, probability of annihilating a particle and antiparticle, and the number density of uh, uh, the particles which are undergoing uh, uh, annihilations. The rate uh, of expansion of the universe uh, is, uh, due to the freeman roberts walker equation, is just uh, 8 pi to the 3 g new uh, two thirds uh, g newton and uh, the total energy density in the universe under square root right this we saw in the uh, standard cosmological reminder of uh, last uh, last week but since we are at uh, very large temperatures here we are much before uh, matter radiation equality as you remember that plot of the evolution this is essentially dominated by radiation so this is uh, the energy density of uh, uh, radiation only, <coughs> which is given by, so if I take out uh, G Newton, which is 1 over M Planck squared, I'm left with uh, 8 pi divided by uh, 93 G star T cube, okay? 
So here I've used the expression of uh, radiation density as a function of the temperature T. So I think it's worth uh, now stopping for one moment uh, and uh, adding something uh, to the cosmology, uh, sorry for those who are very familiar for with this, uh, something to the cosmology reminders that, reminders that, I, that I presented last week. So cosmology again, a little bit, uh, formula that I will use uh, all over uh, today. So the number density of a particle as a function of uh, temperature T is defined uh, by G, the internal degrees of freedom of the particle, and then the integral over the distribution F of P, okay? Where this F of P is, of course, uh, uh, let me write it here and then I will erase it, F is equal to 1 divided by E plus or minus 1, right? So this is the, the standard distribution for uh, both for fermions, uh, plus 1 in the case of fermions, and minus 1 in the case of bosons, right? Bosons and statistics or fermi Dirac statistics. You would have uh, 0 here if this is just the Boltzmann, uh, the Boltzmann, max Boltzmann, Boltzmann distribution. So this is the number density of a particle uh, uh, at the temperature T. The energy density of a particle at temperature T is just given by G again, and then this same integral, and then I have to integrate energy over the distribution. And finally, for completeness, I can also write down the pressure of a particle of a, at fluid, a fluid uh, at temperature T which is G, same integral, momentum divided by 3E, F over P, F of P. Okay, <coughs> so these are the standard formula that you find in any cosmology book. Now in the case of relativistic matter, and then we have no relativistic, ma relativistic matter later, you can explicitly uh, perform these integrals. And so for the case of uh, uh, bosons, uh, you will get that uh, this becomes uh, G zeta 3, zeta of 3, this is the Euler function, I guess, I, some, some special function which, equal, which is equal to 1.2 and something, divided by square T to the 3. In the case of, uh, so this is Bose-Einstein. In the case of uh, Fermi-Dirac distribution, you have that this is uh, 3 fourths G, Z of 3, divided by 5 squared, T3. In the, the case of the energy density, you do exactly the same thing. So performing the integral, you get that for Bose-Einstein, you have uh, g pi square divided by 30 t4. And in the case of Fermi-Dirac, you have uh, g 7 eighths pi square divided by 30 t4. And the pressure is not particularly important, but you get it in the end you get uh, that it's always uh, uh, rho thirds, uh, both uh, for Bose-Einstein and uh, for Fermi-Dirac. No? Which one? Well, uh, either is it P squared. P squared, yes, sorry, sorry. This is P squared, yes. Yeah, yeah. For the case of non relativistic matter, instead the only thing which I need, so the, the, the distributions collapse to the Boltzmann uh, case in both cases. And then uh, I have that this one is uh, uh, mt <coughs> over 2 pi, 3 halves, uh, and then the Boltzmann suppression factor, which is m divided by t, e to the minus m divided by t. The number density, the, the, this is the number density. The energy density is the number density multiplied by the mass, as we used uh, already last time. 
and instead the pressure is uh, the number of density multiplied by the temperature which is typically much much smaller than the, the density so typically we put this to zero and indeed non-relativistic matter is pressureless okay so uh, in general if I want to write down the total um, the total uh, so suppose that I have several fluids, uh, several relativistic fluids, uh, uh, in this case here, and I want to, and I want to write down uh, the total uh, uh, energy density of relativistic particles. So the total energy density in radiation. This will be pi squared divided by 30 g star t4, where G star, G star is defined as the sum over the bosons with their, degrees, with their internal degrees of freedom, Ti divided by T to the fourth plus 7 eighths, uh, the sum over the fermions, Gi, Ti divided by T to the power third. So I'm just summing these two up, uh, summing over all the possible bosons in the fluid uh, and the possible fermions in the fluid. So I'm defining this G star so that uh, this uh, expression is exactly equal, to formally equal to this one, but G star hides the fact that there are several, there are several relativistic fluids uh, inside. And this is, uh, this is uh, what I've been using there. So you see that I translated the raw radiation total into exactly this expression here, so g star and t to the fourth. And under the square root gives you t to the second. And finally, we need another quantity, which is uh, the entropy density. Which is defined as uh, p plus rho divided by the temperature as it comes from uh, thermodynamics <coughs> and so it's essentially if you do the computation you find 2 pi squared divided by 45 g star s t to the 3 where now I have defined this g star s which is exactly like the one before but uh, for the case uh, of uh, a temperature to the, to the power 3 so sum uh, over bosons, Gi ratio of temperatures to the power 3, plus uh, sum over bosons, Gi ratio of temperature to the power 3. Okay? O notice also, if, uh, if you want, that uh, both the entropy and the number density of photons uh, of uh, general relativistic particles are proportional to the power 3. So they will be essentially a bit interchangeable one with the other. So maybe I will just write down here, just for future reference, uh, that the number, if I write down uh, the ratio between entropy and the number density of photons, this is just a ratio of this uh, coefficient here and uh, uh, this uh, coefficient here. And so what I get in the end is, uh, uh, let me write it down. 2 pi square divided by 45 g star s t to the 3 divided by 2 zeta of 3 divided by pi squared t to the 3. Simplifying the t to the 3 and plugging in the values for these quantities, you get 7.04 or something like this. So they are up to order one, essentially the entropy density and the number, f and the number density of photons uh, is uh, this value here. I mean, they are close, to, uh, close to, to each other up to factors of one uh, today. So I'm plugging here the value of uh, G star S today. So the number of degrees of freedom present today in the universe, which is essentially uh, photons uh, and neutrinos, uh, essentially. This quantity will vary, but if I want to find to compute it today, this uh, this is generally generally valuable, uh, valid. No, if I want to put it today, so uh, zero today here, 
then I will find that this is the value that I get. OK, so let me go back. This was just a. Uh, uh, so, so fermions and uh, bosons are treated uh, have the same weight in uh, G star X? I, I don't know. In, uh, in, the, in the entropy? No, you're completely right. I forgot the 7, 8. Uh, yeah, 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 sure. Sorry, sorry. This one, this yeah. here you should have a 7, 8, yes. I wanted to rewrite the same formula, but then I forgot. It's a bit messy, but uh, we will need them later, so I'll leave, I'll leave them here. So here, what I used uh, is just uh, the formula for the total radiation. So basically, this one here. And what I got uh, is, uh, is this. So it means that uh, the number density, uh, let me go here. So the number density of the particle x is equal to, given this, uh, say, uh, series of equalities, 8 uh, pi to the cube divided by 90 g star under square root temperature divided by Planck mass and uh, sigma annihilation. Right? So this is what comes out exactly from, from here. So we are at the moment of freeze out. So this is basically the temperature at freeze out. Right? So this is an uh, inequality that holds uh, at the moment of the temperature of the moment of freeze out. So this is the temperature of freeze out that should go in there. Now, <coughs> uh, this quantity is interesting, but as I was saying before. Uh, it's uh, worth uh, normalizing it in such a way that the expansion of the universe uh, is, uh, uh, say, incorporated so that we don't have to worry about it uh, any longer. So it's worth uh, switching from, uh, instead of uh, using the number density of particles uh, x, uh, to some normalized quantity that I call uh, y for uh, yield, I think, uh, which is defined just uh, as the number density so the wild of the particle x divided by the number density of the particle x divide, divided in units of the entropy density s, which uh, I defined uh, here. I derived there. Hmm? Uh, luckily, there is Philip in the audience. Uh, yes. Yeah, because it comes from there. <coughs> OK? The, the, um, the so I, I could show it, I could show it uh, rigorously, but it's uh, also quite intuitive. The advantage uh, of uh, defining a quantity like this uh, is that, as I was saying, uh, the expansion of the universe uh, is uh, automatically taken into account. Uh, and so a quantity like this uh, will, nev will not change under just the expansion of the universe. Mm -hmm. When uh, number changing uh, processes for the particle x stop, so essentially from this moment on, y will remain constant. It's also intuitive in the sense that uh, number density dilutes uh, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the temperature cube. Uh, density, uh, entropy density also dilutes with the temperature cube, as you see there. So it's intuitive that y will remain constant if there is nothing that changes uh, the, uh, the number density of particles n. But trust me, I mean, one can show it rigorously that y is a constant that remains, uh, is a quantity that remains constant uh, if uh, particle changing processes are not active, active any longer. So that means uh, that uh, if I want uh, the value today, I just uh, can say that this value of for the quantity y, the value today, which I can uh, denote uh, as uh, today or as zero or as, as inf at infinity, meaning at very large, uh, at very large time, uh, uh, very small uh, temperatures, <laughs> will actually be equal to the value of y at the temperature freeze out. As I said, it stays constant. <coughs> but that uh, I have already, right? Because I have uh, this expression here. So let me write it down. This is uh, 8 pi to the cube divided by 90 
g star under square root. <coughs> Uh, and then I have the constants that come uh, from the definition of entropy there. So I have uh, 2 pi squared divided by 45 uh, g star s. <laughs> and then the rest are just uh, 1 uh, over n Planck uh, that comes from uh, here, sigma annihilation, and the temperature of freeze out that comes from here. And here I think there is no square, because I have to take the square root, yeah, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> OK. <coughs> so um, now I have to specify what the temperature freeze out is. So I would be tempted to say, OK, so the temperature freeze out is more or less the mass of the particle, m. So temperature freeze out, uh, roughly, say, the mass uh, roughly the mass of the particle, which I will denote as a big M, OK? So about 100 GV, because I was saying before, as soon as the mass of the particle becomes uh, large, or actually the temperature becomes smaller than the mass of the particle, uh, this can happen any longer. But actually, this uh, is a bit later. So one can show, I mean, uh, here I have to cheat a bit, but the more uh, rigorous treatment will show you that a good approximation for the temperature of freeze out uh, is uh, uh, roughly uh, T freeze out uh, mass of the dark matter particle, Mx, uh, divided by something of the order of 20, 25, or something like this. Mm? So this, take it uh, as, a, as a leap of faith in some sense, uh, it would come out uh, from uh, a semi-analytical, more rigorous uh, uh, analysis of the process uh, of the whole process. So here I'm a, I'm a bit cheating. Yeah. You mean one over? Hmm? You mean one over? I mean uh, no. I mean this because it's a uh, it's a uh, dimension. These are electron volts. So you can measure the temperature in electron volts and the mass as well. Sorry, yeah. Time. No, no temperature. Uh, this uh, is yeah. temperature. T temperature. <laughs> so let's go on. This gives me that uh, y today is uh, uh, this big square root divided by 2 pi squared divided by 45 g star s. Uh, here I had a g star under the square root and some factors that I don't want to write. So just let me simplify by saying uh, that uh, these two quantities are more or less the same. It's not completely true, because if you look at the definition, they're not exactly the same. Mm. But roughly, they can be confused. So let me take them to be more or less uh, uh, the same. So we'll have something uh, from this. Uh, I will get uh, g star to the power minus 1 half, uh, right? And then what's left is uh, 20 from this uh, divided by m Planck uh, sigma annihilation and the mass of the particle x. OK, so this is more or less my final answer, but uh, uh, we are not so constants. And uh, uh, OK, so th this one is, a, is, a, is a G star, so the number of degrees of freedom in the early universe at that time there. And it's roughly of the order of uh, 1 over square root of 100. 106 uh, precise. You have to sum all the degrees of freedom known in the standard model at a temperature of about uh, 5 GeV, and you will get this is what you, what you have. Uh, roughly square root of 100, so roughly 0 0.1. Uh, 1 over 0 0.1. Uh, no, uh, totally 0 0.1 is yes. like this. So the y today, the yield of the x particle today is uh, constants numbers uh, divided constant divided by these two quantities here the mass uh, and uh, the equation cross section <coughs> now i'm not uh, i'm not used to yield what i've been talking about uh, for the past uh, two weeks uh, is another quantity as you remember which is uh, omega x h squared so omega dark matter h squared where h is the reduced uh, hubble constant so let me translate this quantity into this they are clearly the same thing right so this is the dark matter density and this is uh, the ratio of dark matter density over the critical density, and this is uh, uh, connected to the number density of the particle uh, of the dark matter particle. So they are clearly connected. How exactly they are connected? Well, it's very easy. So this quantity, m which I remind you is measured today, is just 
rho x divided by rho critical h squared this is by the definition of omega and this quantity is uh, mass of x number density of x divided by rho critical h squared here I'm just using that the number density for a non relativistic particle is just the number times the mass sorry the energy density for a non relativistic particle is this so this is mass oof, I can pick up mass of x times number density given the definition of y is y today times entropy today divided by rho critical h squared and we're almost there so this is I have a mass in front and then I have y today that I have to to rewrite so let me call uh, this big thing uh, including this uh, this approximation let me call it uh, constant uh, a number so I have uh, mx then uh, the constant and then uh, uh, 20 divided by m Planck uh, sigma annihilation mx uh, times uh, entropy today the whole divided by rho critical h squared it's getting better so what you see here is that the mass cancels mm. so the mass of the particle at least in this rough approximation that I'm doing uh, is not relevant uh, in determining the final uh, relic abundance uh, omega x uh, h squared and this physically physically is uh, is clear so what I'm saying is that if a particle uh, is uh, uh, more massive then its freeze out uh, will happen uh, uh, it's a particle a large mass of particle x means uh, that I will have uh, um, a freeze out that happens earlier right because this is the temperature freeze out uh, it's of the order of uh, 20th of the mass so a higher temperature so her earlier but so in the end uh, uh, I will have uh, um, so happens uh, earlier so how does it work so we have uh, more dilution as the universe expands and so we have less particles left in the end but at the same time they are more massive and so the total energy density doesn't change okay so more massive particles means uh, early freeze out uh, means uh, more dilution so fewer particles left uh, but they are more massive and so in total the two things compensate uh, and the particles cancels indeed the one factor of mass uh, comes from here and the other factors of mass uh, comes from uh, here okay <coughs> now we are, I'm almost there because if I put uh, the values for these quantities here so let me give you the values explicitly so the, de the entropy today if you if you take the definition I gave above uh, is uh, uh, 2,889 per centimeter cube the critical density today is uh, 1.053 10 to the minus 5 uh, in units of uh, h squared gv divided by centimeter cube and so when the, the dust uh, settles uh, you have uh, that this quantity here is basically the constant I, you also of course uh, replace uh, m, uh, m Planck and so you have uh, a big constant in front uh, that I'm going to write down in a minute uh, divided by the only only physical parameter that remains uh, which is uh, sigma annihilation and this constant here if you do the computations properly is uh, 0 0.1 picobarn <laughs> plug in the numbers uh, and you get uh, and you get something like this well a picobarn is of course 10 to the minus 12 barns uh, which is uh, 10 to the minus 36 uh, centimeters squared 
Mm. So indeed, uh, this is a centimeter square. This is a cross section, so it's a, an area uh, in terms of dimensions. Uh, and this is dimensionless as it, uh, as it should be. So what I found out uh, is that <coughs> omega x squared, omega x h squared, is equal to uh, a constant divided by the only physical parameter, which is a sigma uh, v, a sigma, sigma annihilation. Actually, I've been a bit sloppy here, so I've not uh, put the actual physical quantities in. Instead of si sigma annihilation here, I should have a quantity called, and I will see, we will see later why, which is the thermal average of ve over the velocity, velocities of uh, the annihilation cross-section. Roughly the same thing, but uh, with some important differences. And the number which is there, I can re-express it here as 3 10 to the minus 27 centimeter cube per second. So I have a very simple expression for what omega x will be in the case of thermal freeze out. Let me uh, put this in a square so that I don't erase it uh, later. This is for the case of uh, freeze out. Uh, so the sigma v, does that come from the fact that the it particles are not fully relativistic when, so you said gamma? No, they are not relativistic, yeah. They're certain. Right, so gamma then that you have written there is, is not like one over time. I mean, so this is a bit cheating, as I was saying. No? So I'm just uh, taking orders of magnitude. Right. What I should do is to solve uh, the proper Boltzmann equation that we'll write down uh, later. Or I guess I would have thought if gamma was 1 over time, then I would have nx sigma times v of the particle. Yeah, I, yeah, you should replace it there. In C, I think there. You should replace this quantity with, uh, with sigma v, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can express so, it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, let's say basically this works, but the actual quantity which you have to put in there that comes out from the Boltzmann equation is uh, the thermal average of sigma v rather than just a simple annihilation cross section. As I will say later, for most particle physics models, uh, the two things are essentially interchangeable. So, but okay, let, let's get to that later. So, the physical, uh, so what I'm saying is uh, omega x is uh, inversely proportional to sigma, to sigma v annihilation sigma annihilation times v. So it means that uh, if I have a larger annihilation cross-section, so if a particle, due to its particle physics properties, uh, has a, a larger annihilation cross-section, then uh, the omega x will, will be smaller. So the relic abundance will be smaller. And this is clear, no? So if I have a larger annihilation cross-section, this particle will stay, will be able to annihilate longer as the universe expands. Uh, and so in the end, it will follow this distribution, this equilibrium distribution for a bit longer, and then it will freeze out, uh, it will freeze out uh, later, and so you'll have a smaller omega x. If instead a particle has a large, um, uh, yeah, so a small annihilation cross-section, the omega x that you get in the end is larger. And that's because uh, if, the omega, omega, if the annihilation cross-section is smaller, then it will freeze out uh, earlier and what you get uh, is a larger relic abundance in the end. So the intuitive uh, meaning of the inverse uh, of the dependence with the inverse of this cross-section is clear. Okay, so the actual computation that I should do here instead of, uh, this is the final result the, the, that I get, but the actual computation that I should do is uh, uh, solving indeed uh, the Boltzmann equation for this system. I will just uh, write down the equation and then uh, sketch uh, the, so I guess in the interest of time I will not uh, write down uh, the analytical uh, solutions to different regimes, uh, but I will just sketch uh, what happens in the end. So the cartoon that I showed you here is basically the uh, result of solving properly the Boltzmann equation for the, uh, for the, um, Denver density of, of particles x, uh, which is the following. And for the moment, uh, let me write down here interactions. Uh, the change, uh, changing uh, the number of particles. 
So this is the equation that I should solve, uh, where h uh, is usually uh, the, the hub constant, so it is defined as uh, a prime uh, uh, a dot uh, over, over a. So this tells me how the number density of particle x uh, evolves uh, in a system which is uh, expanding, so in an expanding universe, uh, and the expansion is given by this term here, and uh, where there are some processes that change uh, the number of uh, uh, particles uh, x uh, and uh, x bar. So this quantity here is actually the sum of particles uh, plus antiparticles uh, if you properly uh, normalize, uh, normalize the quantities. So to the left hand side uh, here you can show from uh, say a basic principles so starting from collision integrals uh, and, and so on. You know, on the right hand side here what you will have is uh, sigma annihilations times V thermal average indeed this is the quantity that enters there times uh, n x squared minus n x equilibrium squared where n x equilibrium is uh, nothing but uh, this quantity here so what I'm saying is that uh, there are two terms uh, in the equation the term which is referred to cosmology which is this one here and the term uh, which is uh, referring to particle physics which is this term here right so if uh, there are uh, no particle physics uh, uh, effects, uh, so if uh, there are no annihilations happening uh, and nothing uh, like that, uh, then uh, this equation is very simple to solve. It's a first order differential equation in uh, an X, for which uh, the solution is, uh, so if I neglect this part here, the solution is, uh, of course, an X proportional to A to the minus 3. Mm? Just solve this and you will get uh, uh, precisely this behavior. Nothing surprising. I'm saying that the number density of particle x uh, under just the cosmological expansions uh, expansion dilutes as one over the volume of the universe as usual. While instead uh, this quantity here, the particle physics quantity, is dictating uh, what particle physics does uh, to the uh, to the to the number density x. Mm. So basically, what this quantity is doing is. Uh, as long as, so forget about this uh, expansion now and keep only this term here. As long as uh, sigma v is large enough, what this means uh, is that uh, the number density nx will be driven to the number density nx at equilibrium. Right? So it's, it's also intuitive. If you have uh, nx which is uh, smaller than nx equilibrium, then uh, this term uh, will be uh, negative so uh, this term will be totally positive and so it means uh, that uh, nx uh, the derivative with respect to time of nx uh, is positive and so nx will uh, increase uh, and so it will go closer to nx equilibrium the other way around uh, if nx is uh, smaller uh, larger than uh, the equilibrium value this quantity, this term will be uh, posit positive, yes. So the total will be negative in front, uh, and so the time derivative will be negative, and so nx uh, will uh, uh, decrease, uh, and in the end uh, you will get uh, closer to an equilibrium as well. Right? So this simple differential equation, if you solve it by hand, uh, it's just telling you that uh, as long as uh, sigma v is large, then uh, you get uh, stuck. Uh, at the equilibrium value, which essentially means that you follow this distribution here. At some point, uh, this term is not, valid, is not uh, uh, large enough to keep up, uh, and so nx will depart from equilibrium and will follow this uh, uh, behavior there, apart from the expansion which is uh, factored in this term. Okay, shall we stop now or uh, discuss the last couple of things uh, about freeze out? How much time? I will need probably 10 more minutes to discuss the, the, the end of freeze out uh, and, then, uh, and then we stop, stop, here. stop here. Okay. Okay, so <coughs> this is about my equation. Uh, let's say that typically in uh, everyday life, uh, what you would do is that uh, <coughs> you, you code this into a computer code, whatever, 
and, uh, and you, you just plug in uh, the physical uh, parameters, the particle physics parameters for the uh, annihilation cross-section, and then uh, and for the evolution of the universe, and then uh, essentially you let it go and, uh, and see what happens. Uh, and what you get in the end uh, is basically this uh, picture here. So I decided for the interest of time, I'm not going to discuss the, the, the semi-analytic semi uh, uh, solutions that you can get for this equation in some, uh, in some regimes. Uh, they will be in the notes uh, that I will put online uh, later today or next week. Basically, what you will get is a, a better uh, determination of uh, this formula here. Instead of having just uh, hand-waving uh, um, expressions uh, like I did uh, in this blackboard, you will find uh, something a bit more precise. <coughs> so there are several levels, let's say. This is a completely intuitive and hand-waving way, or you can do semi-analytical solutions and find something better, or actually what you typically really do is uh, solve this numerically and see what comes out. However, I want to do two uh, side comments. One side comment and, uh, and, an, important, uh, and an important comment later. So the, the quantity which is, uh, which is crucial here uh, is uh, the sigma annihilation times v averaged. Well, this means uh, uh, precisely, I mean, what I'm defining with these uh, uh, brackets uh, is that I'm doing the thermal average, so the, the average over the uh, distributions uh, of the particles uh, which uh, of dark matter which are colliding. So you have uh, a process in which you have the x uh, and the x bar particle which, is, uh, which are approaching each other. This one, say, has momentum p1 and this one has momentum p2. So what I'm writing here is uh, technically just uh, this quantity here, P2, sigma an v rel. So this is the veloc relative velocity of which, uh, in the center of mass, uh, mass in which the two particles uh, approach each other, times, uh, so weighted by the distribution of the particle 1 and the distribution of the particle 2 say, function of the energy or function of the momentum, as I, as I wrote there. Since we are in thermal, uh, in, a, in the in a relati non-relativistic case, uh, it's just essentially the, the Boltzmann, uh, Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, normalized by, well, of course, uh, D3P1, D3P2, Fe1, Fe2. So this is what I, I mean uh, by when I write this quantity here. So the question now could be, this, uh, this expression contains uh, the velocity, right? So does it matter when uh, two particles of dark matter uh, collide, uh, whether they are in an environment with more velocity or less velocity? <coughs> so can it be different? Can this quantity be different? Uh, and so annihilations proceed differently in uh, epochs uh, in which the velocity of dark matter particles wor was different, or even in places uh, where the velocity of dark matter particles is different, say, at the center of the galaxy, maybe pa dark matter particles are faster than uh, at the periphery of the galaxies. Yeah, so typically the answer is typically yes. So it might, uh, it might uh, be important. So velocity is, uh, a crucial, uh, is, is an important ingredient here. However, what happens is that uh, <coughs> I can always, uh, in, in practical cases, I can always uh, expand sigma v into powers, uh, since we are talking about small velocities, uh, the, the dark matter particles are non-relativistic, I can expand into uh, powers of the velocity, such as this, where you see that the first term does not depend on the velocity, while the second one depends uh, on, uh, on, on the velocity. So it turns out that for most, uh, say, particle physics models, uh, called, uh, which uh, I mean, for several particle physics models, uh, the particle physics is such uh, that uh, this term uh, is uh, present uh, and uh, relevant, so that this one can be neglected. So this is a uh, velocity is typically much, much smaller than the speed of light, so non-relativistic, much, much smaller than C, so typically you can neglect this, uh, this, uh, this term with respect to this one here. This is the S wave term and this is the p wave term so for most particle physics most uh, let's say for several particle physics models uh, the annihilations happen in s wave so essentially you keep uh, only this term here and neglect this one and so in the end uh, what you have is that this quantity here goes back to be something velocity independent uh, like this like sigma zero 
in other models in which instead P wave, this quantity, this, uh, this term is absent uh, for different reasons uh, related to the particle physics of the collision, then uh, you have to keep this one. And then in that case, the, the, the annihilation is in P wave. And then this is, the, this is relevant and, and you have to keep it in. Now, the most important comment that I want to make is the following <coughs> concerning uh, thermal freeze out. So we said that, that uh, uh, in thermal freeze out, uh, what I have is that uh, omega x h squared is given by that number divided by, let me take the, the, the less slightly less precise version, 0 0.1 picobarn divided by sigma annihilation. OK? I'm forgetting the velocity for the moment. And you know that this quantity here has to be as observed in cosmology, 0 0.1186. So <coughs> the number that I gave, right, Ricardo? So this has to be 11 point 0 0.1186, as observed in cosmology. It's the first number I wrote down the first day, probably. Corresponds to the 26% of dark matter in the universe, right? So let's uh, take uh, a model, a simple model, and compute uh, sigma annihilation, or actually estimate uh, sigma annihilation, a simple particle physics model. So let's assume uh, that I have a particle X, which is uh, <coughs> interacting with uh, uh, this kind of diagram. So X and X bar going, say, into fermion and fermion. This could be electrons and positron with weak interactions. Well, let me first say this is the diagram that I want to consider. So a toy diagram of two particles. Uh, X and X bar annihilating uh, uh, in the S channel into a couple of fermions and fermions. So I can estimate this to be typically alpha squared divided by, uh, so the internal degrees of freedom of the particle X times uh, the mass of the dark matter, actually the mass of the particle X mm -hmm. squared. Mm -hmm. So roughly this is what I, what I have. Th I have uh, two vertices here, so you expect uh, this to, to appear, alpha uh, to the power 2. Alpha is just uh, the coupling constant, uh, right? And so like uh, the hyperfine hyper coupling constant, uh, the hyperfine um, uh, hyper constant, yes. G squared divided by 4 pi, typically. OK. So in each of these vertex uh, here, you have uh, a G. So you would expect that in the, so in, the, in the amplitude you have g squared, and so in the cross-section you have uh, g to the 4 or alpha, alpha squared. Right, so this is a rough estimate of, uh, num say, dimensional estimation of what this cross-section would be. Now let me assume uh, that this is uh, a particle that interacts uh, with the weak interactions uh, in the sense of the SU2 left uh, of the standard model. Right? So weak interactions in the sense of the SU2 left of the standard model. Then uh, I know these numbers. So I can plug in uh, G, the G electroweak, which is determined by uh, Fermi constant. Uh, and it turns out to be G electroweak equal to 0 0.41, I think. <coughs> and I can uh, assume that the mass uh, of the dark matter particles is of the order of the mass of the uh, weak interactions, so of the order of 100 GeV. Mm? I mean, this is not so crucial. I'm taking the mass of the dark matter particle to be, uh, to be of this order here, but if it's not the mass of the dark matter particle that enters here, it would be the mass uh, of the uh, mediated uh, boson here, which would be the Z or the W, so typically of the order of 100 GeV as well. Oh, it depends. Uh, yeah, S also by direct detection and by other things. But I'm just uh, yeah, no, no. not necessary. Not necessary. There are corners. No, not necessary. There are corners in which you can uh, hide uh, these kind of things. I mean, the very simple case in which in which this is mediated by the Z. Yes, it's completely excluded. But uh, this is just a toy a toy example. There are particles in this category which are not excluded at all. Now let, let me get to the point. So if I plug in these numbers, right, so I have uh, everything uh, in place, uh, what I get here is, uh, so the, the, the internal degrees of freedom of the particle, I can take them to be 2, if it's the rock firm or whatever. And what I get is uh, uh, plugging in number 10 to the minus 36 centimeters centimeter squared, uh, that is 1 picobarn. Okay? 
So for a particle with uh, weak interactions and with a typical weak scale mass, uh, the sigma annihilation is typically of the order one picobar. So if I plug it in here, I get uh, what? No, no, GX is not GX is not coupling of the X. It's not the coupling; it's the internal degrees of freedom. Ah, okay. Okay. Well, no, it's the internal degrees of freedom of the particle itself. So it's only two. It's not the total G star of cosmology or uh, that we that we said before. Yeah. So this uh, this would be two, say, or four. <coughs> so what I get is that. Uh, for a particle with uh, weak interactions, uh, I get that this quantity here is typically one picobar, and so naturally I get 0 0.1. It's a miracle, right? So I have uh, the miraculous coincidence that for a particle with weak interactions, and with typical weak mass, uh, the relic abundance that I get in the end uh, is exactly what I need in order to compare with cosmology, with uh, the observed cosmological abundance. This is what indeed is called uh, WIMP miracle. The WIMP miracle says that uh, weakly interacting <coughs> massive particles. Uh, with uh, weak interaction cross section, uh, weak interaction couplings, uh, and the typical uh, weak uh, mass, uh, give you automatically the cosmological relic abundance uh, for free, in some sense. Which is why people are so fond of uh, WIMPs, uh, of weakly interacting massive particles. Mm? <coughs> now, this is very sketchy. Uh, so, this is also the reason why I was assuming a 100 GV mass there. Because this works typically for this kind of uh, for this kind of masses, and so that's why I had assumed that value there. Mm. Now this is very sketchy. One could do something more precise. There might be several diagrams contributing to this annihilation cross section, whatever. So you don't have to take 100 GV as uh, fixed. It can be between say 5 TV, 5 GV to 100 TV or something like this. It's really a ballpark. But the main point is that uh, in natural, in some sense. Uh, a particle with these properties uh, comes out uh, in the correct relic abundance. So in this sense, uh, the thermal freeze-out is uh, the, a very natural mechanism. You just uh, take the thermal bath, throw in uh, a particle with, uh, say, this kind of properties, and what you get out is uh, exactly what you need, what you observe in cosmology. Because sigma determines uh, the amount, uh, the moment of freeze out, and the rest is just uh, thermal evolution. Nothing. Uh, you're not putting in any any new ingredient. Notice one thing. So, are you convinced that this is very natural and very appealing? Mm? You have the universe. You throw in this particle, and you get out what you what you observe. Great. Notice just one thing. That here I have uh, a ratio between uh, alpha and. Uh, m of mass of the particle. So basically, this is, uh, since I wrote it here, this is, uh, uh, so sigma an is typically uh, g4 divided by mass of the particle squared, mm? if you plug it in. So as I said, uh, this works well for weakly interacting massive particles, electroweak interactions, electroweak mass. But it can work also for other models uh, just by playing uh, with these two parameters. So if I have uh, particles which are heavier, but at the same time have uh, a larger coupling than the electroweak one, sigma n will also come out to be about uh, one picobar, and the miracle appears anyway. Or if I have uh, lighter particles <coughs> that have uh, a smaller coupling with the, cur with the correct powers uh, g, then uh, also sigma hank hank comes out to be the right number, and so the miracle happens anyway. This is what is called uh, sometimes uh, the WIMP-less miracle. So it's just the realization that uh, you can play the same game, uh, not just for some well-known interactions such as the SU2 left of the standard model, but for some other force uh, that has, uh, say, a smaller coupling uh, with a lighter dark matter candidate. Or 
li higher coupling as a larger coupling with, more, with larger uh, dark matter mass. You can open a uh, fan. But this makes it also easier to, exc to exclude the numbers uh, in the system, I guess. Yeah, so again, so this is a bit uh, oversimplified. So at the LHC, you would have, uh, uh, I mean, we will get to the LHC constraints possibly in, in a couple of uh, weeks, and so I will discuss cases in which you can evade also this. OK, let me move on and uh, discuss uh, asymmetry dark matter. But I want to leave something on the blackboard. So the rest will be essentially cartoons, <coughs> cartoons only, and just uh, hand waving uh, so approximations. for asymmetric dark matter and for freezing. I want to keep this. OK, so now I'm discussing the case of uh, asymmetric dark matter, which is a completely different uh, mechanism for producing uh, dark matter for explaining how dark matter was produced in the, in the early universe <coughs> and which works uh, in the following way. So consider again uh, an X particle, but now the assumptions are a bit different. So again, I have that this X particle can annihilate into FF bar, uh, again, whatever that is. And I just require that this annihilation cross-section is, uh, say, Largish, so large enough that I don't have to worry for it to become non-efficient at some point. You remember that this was the case before. The point was that sigma n at some point becomes inefficient with respect to expansion. Here I just say this is larger than uh, some amount, so that this always uh, can happen. This typically re uh, requires uh, a few times uh, sigma electroweak, so it's not such a drastic assumption. Anyway, it's large enough that I don't have to worry. Then I have a particle that is, uh, again, uh, heavy. Typically think of, uh, say, a few GV. And we'll be clear later why this is a good ballpark. Again, it's a particle which is stable. Again, we are in an expanding universe. And the crucial assumption is that now, instead of having uh, a, um, a symmetric uh, initial uh, abundance, so the same number for x and anti-x, I have uh, that uh, the initial conditions are such that there is uh, an asymmetry. So x, say x by, by to fix the ideas, is slightly larger than x bar by a tiny amount, eh? not much. Typically, it can be 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 10, or something like this. So initially, for some unknown reason, there is a little bit of dark matter than anti-dark matter. Now, let me evolve, uh, as uh, before in the cartoon, the evolution of these uh, uh, particles, x and x bar. Now I'm forced to consider the two separately because they are uh, uh, they start they, they have a different uh, initial abundance. So I just I cannot just do, do the sum. So let me denote uh, n x in red and uh, n x bar in uh, in blue. So at the beginning the temperature is so high that the two are essentially at the same level. This small initial abundance doesn't make any difference. We are uh, so, there are so many NX and so many NX bar that the fact that they have a little uh, initial asymmetry doesn't matter at all. And so again, in this condition here, I can have annihilation happening uh, and inverse uh, reactions happening as well, right? Exactly like before. At some point, uh, I will have uh, that for some temperature, <coughs> like before, the mass of the dark matter particle becomes important. And so kinematically, these reactions uh, cannot happen any longer. Mm -hmm. So I can have only an x and an x bar uh, annihilations uh, to, uh, towards uh, standard model particles. So I will have uh, that the two densities uh, will uh, uh, start decreasing uh, like uh, we did before. 
like this. But then at some point, so this is a log plot, so as I go down uh, the density of uh, nx and x bar <coughs> becomes uh, smaller and smaller and smaller. And at some point, <coughs> the, 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 the densities become of the order of the asymmetry itself. So at some point, I start noticing that there are fewer x bar particles than uh, x particles. So at some point, uh, here, say, even this reaction cannot happen any longer, so the annihilation cannot happen any longer, not because of the expansion of the universe, uh, which is uh, making uh, uh, the, the, the collision between uh, an x and x particle uh, uh, improbable, unlikely, but because I'm essentially running out of targets, right? So the x particles uh, are less abundant, and so I don't have them uh, in a sufficient amount to annihilate against the x particles. So we'll have that uh, the x particles will become less and less and less, fewer and fewer and fewer, and at some the x bar particles, sorry, and at some point uh, the density, the number density of an x uh, will necessarily stop decreasing because there are no targets any longer, so we get essentially to zero. Right? Is it clear? So because of the absence uh, of uh, x bar particles, I will get a residual amount uh, of x particles which have not been able to annihilate against anyone. So this is exactly what happens, uh, and this will be the final re relic abundance. Mm? This is exactly what happens for baryons. Mm? So in baryons, what we have uh, is that uh, the omega baryon, so the, the number density, uh, the relative uh, energy density of baryons, uh, is given by mass of the baryons uh, times uh, the number density of baryons divided by rho critical. And this number density of baryons here is the residual of uh, an initial asymmetry between baryons and antibaryons. Mm? So for some unknown reason, in the very early universe, uh, we had uh, a, 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 a phenomenon that uh, uh, produced uh, a little imbalance between the number of baryons and the number of antibaryons which is called baryogenesis indeed. And what is left over is uh, the residual amount, of, uh, residual amount of baryons. So uh, this is how we think that ordinary matter was produced. So plugging in uh, the, I can also write, it, uh, write this like uh, uh, m baryons times eta, number of photons uh, divided by rho critical where this eta is just the uh, number of baryons, the number density of baryons divided by the number density of photons, uh, as I defined uh, uh, last week uh, in the when I was discussing uh, uh, BBN. Uh, Marco, so in, in the case where uh, you have, uh, where the ash particles determinants can uh, create x and x bar, yeah. so you assume that there is some charge uh, conserved for the x particles so that, uh, that you maintain uh, is, uh, is asymmetric. That I maintain the asymmetry. Yes, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So this, uh, uh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So there must be no wash out about the of the asymmetry due to these processes here, but uh, yeah, like for baryons. So here I'm saying that, that uh, it might be the same also for dark matter. So it might be that uh, uh, the mechanism is exactly the same. So the the final relic abundance that I get uh, due to this cartoon here is that. Uh, uh, the particles which are left uh, are the dark matter ones, uh, say for definiteness, or x. Mm -hmm. So the omega, band, the omega dark matter that I get in the end is just uh, mass of the dark matter times uh, uh, number of dark matter divided by rho critical. So it's a darkogenesis in some sense. This is what comes out from baryogenesis, uh, the mechanism that produces the imbalance between baryons and antibaryons. Uh, and here is darkogenesis, a mechanism that produces in some way the imbalance between dark matter and anti-dark matter. And then uh, when it evolves, uh, what you're left with is just uh, dark matter particles uh, that give you the total omega dark matter. So I can write it down like uh, mass of the dark matter times eta dark matter, in this case, uh, and gamma divided by rho critical. Mm. 
So notice two things uh, that uh, in this case here, um, uh, le let me rewrite uh, just here. I have that uh, omega dark matter. I could put an h square somewhere, but okay, it doesn't matter. h square is proportional to <coughs> mass of the dark matter times uh, eta dark matter. And then if I plug in uh, the number density of photons divided by the, the critical density, so I plug in the numbers. Uh, number density of photons, I gave it there somewhere. And the row critical, I gave it, uh, I gave it before. It's uh, that uh, 1 10 to the minus 5 GV per centimeter cube. This gives me something like 2.6 10 to the minus 8. So in the case of asymmetric dark matter, the final omega, di omega dark matter is determined by a completely different uh, equation, say, with respect to the case of result. Here I'm sensitive to the mass of the dark matter, and I was not there. And uh, the initial asymmetry, eta zero, e eta dark matter. So the difference uh, between uh, dark matter and anti-dark matter particles. So completely different parametric dependence uh, from the particle physics properties of dark matter, mass uh, and asymmetry here, while annihilation cross-section there. Also, no, yeah. Yeah, the, there, yes. Actually, so the so the hmm? The sigma here, so the this. Square, so so if you want, yes, but. Yeah, it's, but not, it's not exactly clear that it depends on the mass. The no, case. let's say that the, 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 the quantity that it enters there is the, is the annihilation cross section. Yeah. yeah. Then how would that depend on the properties of the dark matter itself? Uh, uh, yeah, it, it, not necessarily. I mean, if it's light dark matter, the mass that enters there, say, light dark matter that interacts uh, weakly. The mass that enters there is just a uh, Fermi constant. It's not the mass of dark matter. So in that case, uh, it doesn't enter necessarily. It might, however. So for heavy dark matter, heavy WIMPs, uh, it does enter there. The, the second thing, I guess if the asymmetry is too small, then the expansion of the universe is going to take over before you reach the symmetry and you go back to your equation on the right. Yeah, so this is what, uh, yeah, OK. So you can mix up the two mechanisms in some way. But this is what I'm saying here, that uh, I want uh, the annihilation cross-section to be large enough uh, that I don't have to worry. It's, uh, this is yeah? guaranteed by that. that yeah. In some sense, this condition tells you that you don't have to worry about that. So uh, expansion will never stop you in some way. It, what stops you is the, 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 the end of the target particles to annihilate against. Uh, so I say that uh, lar the annihilation cross-section has to be large, whatever large means. It means that essentially doesn't, you, don't, you don't have to care. Now, <coughs> this is what comes out from symmetric dark matter. Um, why this is uh, particularly appealing? Well, uh, let's say there are two reasons why this is particularly appealing. The first one is, uh, uh, say, more philosophical in some sense. Uh, and it is that uh, it's also a very natural, in some way, mechanism for producing dark matter, but natural in the sense that it's uh, the same as for ordinary matter. So we know that ordinary matter exists. Uh, it's here. And uh, we know that it has been produced uh, thanks uh, to an initial asymmetry. Well, you don't, we don't know where it, that asymmetry comes from, but we know that baryogenesis works uh, thanks to an initial asymmetry. And here I'm applying exactly the same thing to dark matter. Mm. So in this sense, uh, it's natural. I don't know what's your f what your feeling is, uh, whether this is more natural or this is more natural. So this was uh, natural, as I said, because what I do is that uh, I throw in a particle and I get automatically what I need at the end provided that it has the, some properties which are like this, for instance. Here, instead, I'm uh, tuning an initial asymmetry, but the mechanism is the same as I have for ordinary matter. Depending on your feelings, uh, this is more natural or that is more natural. The other, way why this is, uh, the other reason why this is uh, popular uh, recently, say, is that, uh, OK, maybe you can divide, devise a model in which uh, this uh, asymmetry, so the asymmetry or in the dark matter sector, is the same uh, as uh, the asymmetry in the baryonic sector, which is the 6 uh, 10 to the minus 10 uh, that I discussed uh, last week uh, for, uh, for BBN. Mm. So if this is the case, uh, and this could be due to the fact that uh, 
the mechanism of production of the asymmetry is linked between the visible sector and the dark sector. So say you produce an imbalance in the, in the baryon sector and you produce the anti-imbalance due to the fact that you produce the anti-imbalance in the, in the dark sector. So if these uh, are the same number, then you have a prediction for the mass, right? Because uh, we know that omega baryon is 4% uh, in, the, in, the, in cosmology. We know that omega dark matter is 26%. Uh, so the ratio between this and this, uh, omega, as I, as I wrote the first day, is uh, 5.4, if I remember correctly. And so you have a prediction that uh, the mass of the dark matter, in this case, uh, should be 5.4 times uh, the mass of the baryon, so essentially the mass of the proton, so essentially a GV. So, so I, I don't understand that anymore this, this uh, dimension. So there is a proportionality factor, no? There is a proportionality. There is a, you're writing something, so omega dark matter is proportional. Yeah, to in the sense that the, the units are not correct, you say? But no. With the proportionality, it's okay because. Uh, but then I don't understand why there is this 10 to the minus 8 at the denominator. 10 to the minus 8 at the denominator? Uh, so the right hand side is dimension 1 and the... Uh, yeah, this, this, has to be, th this has to be dimensionless. This is a mass. mass is this is dimensional, so I'm forgetting a GV at the denominator, I think, right? Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, uh, let, let me check later because I'm not completely sure whether it's a GV or like I, I inverted. Uh, no, I think it's a GV because okay. centimeter cube. So this comes from rho critical, which is GV over centimeter cube. And this is a centimeter, one, one over centimeter cube. So I, I'll check later, but it should okay. be okay. Now I understand yeah, now, now I'm worried about whether this is a, no, it's minus eight because it comes out, the numbers come out correct, I think. So this is a sort of prediction in some sense. Uh, if uh, asymmetric dark matter is the answer, so uh, dark matter was produced by, asymmetric, uh, by an asymmetric uh, process like this, uh, then uh, you have a prediction that dark matter should have a mass of about uh, 5 GV or so. And this is a part was particularly popular a few years ago because there were some indications uh, in some experiments uh, of direct detection, like DAMA and others, uh, that were finding indeed that light dark matter, light in this sense of the order of a few GV, was possibly responsible for uh, uh, signals in their, uh, in their experiment. And we will discuss this uh, next time. So in some sense, symmetric dark matter, which is an old proposal from the 80s, uh, has become popular again like uh, five, six years ago because of this coincidence uh, that allows you to predict uh, a dark matter mass of the order of a few GV. And finally, I want to address the last mechanism which is freezing which will have uh, yet another dependence on uh, on uh, on the parameters so freezing is again a completely different idea <coughs> And the idea is the following, that uh, we have a particle that uh, X, which will be the dark matter, of course, which was not present in the early universe. I mean, it was not there from the beginning. Its abundance was zero. But it got produced uh, little by little by the other particles present at the time. And in the end, uh, it ended up being uh, dominant. So if you want an analogy, it's like uh, uh, rodents uh, in, uh, in the Pleistocene. So when uh, dinosaurs were uh, uh, extinguishing themselves uh, because of the meteorite or whatever, the rodents, uh, small and uh, tiny, were a little bit uh, progressing in numbers. And in the end, they became dominant while the dinosaurs uh, died away. So the story is more or less the same, is more or less the following. So I do the, my usual plot. Uh, as a function of uh, 1 over the temperature of time <coughs> of the number density of this particle n. And now I have uh, that uh, I consider a particle x such as its uh, subject to um, production 
uh, interactions with the thermal bath, uh, that again I call uh, F, of different sorts. For instance, I can have that the fermion the thermal in the thermal bath, uh, say, I don't know, uh, uh, a quark or whatever, can decay into XX bar, or I can have, uh, as usual, uh, interactions of this sort, uh, or I can have uh, single productions of this sort, mm -hmm. like uh, E plus E minus producing uh, a particle uh, X. And this happens uh, with a very small rate. And this is crucial, right? So the rate of these equations, uh, the rate of these processes to happen is very small. Basically, I'm saying that uh, I can have diagrams such as uh, uh, this. X, X bar, or uh, such as this. or such as this. And these are always the F. And the coupling, uh, which is uh, in here, lambda, say it, call it, uh, or in here, or in here, is very small. Typically, we'll see later that it has to be of the order of 10 to the minus 13, or something like this. But um, not necessarily. I mean, this is completely general. Yes. Why? Uh, Otherwise, yes. Uh, no. Okay. Yes. That, okay. Then in this case, f can be. Yeah. F is not a good. Uh, so let's say standard model. Okay. I don't. I don't want to write everything else. But these are particles of the standard model, and uh, and, uh, and the rest. Yeah. Okay. Now again, let's consider that this particle X uh, is heavy. In some uh, way. So typically, it can be again 100 GeV just to fix the ideas. <coughs> it's stable, as usual. It's in an expanding uh, universe. And uh, now it has zero initial abundance. Zero initial, OK? So it has zero initial abundance, and it, it's produced uh, with a very small rate <coughs> as a uh, 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 from uh, the, the standard model, uh, from the standard model particles. So basically, what happens is the following, that you have uh, the thermal bath of particles, which are here, mm, the standard model particles, uh, and you have uh, initially zero X particles uh, there. But due to these uh, processes, uh, let's call it SM, due to these processes with that happen with very small rate, while uh, the universe evolves, uh, a very small uh, abundance uh, of these uh, X particles uh, is produced steadily, slowly, but steadily. Okay. At some point, uh, the particles uh, of the standard model will uh, start uh, uh, going out of equilibrium because they are massive particles, such as, uh, say, for instance, uh, the W boson or Z boson or, or something else. And then uh, this will uh, decrease uh, in number. And so at that point, uh, this uh, abundance will also freeze, because essentially, essentially you have, uh, in one of the possible scenarios, you have uh, uh, closed the, 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 the initial source uh, for the dark matter particles. Mm -hmm. So in at this moment here, you have a sort of uh, freeze in of the abundance, in which uh, this uh, equation stops. Uh, This equation stops, and the density is, uh, is uh, frozen. Now, this can happen for different reasons. But let's say I'm saying that one of the possibi possibilities is that uh, the standard model particle, which is the origin of this decay here, is too heavy. And so at some point, uh, it, its mass is larger than the temperature of the universe. So its abundance decreases. And so you cannot produce X particles any longer. Or it can also be that uh, simply the particle is light. Uh, the particle of the standard model is light, but the temperature that it has uh, is not uh, sufficient any longer to produce uh, the mass of x and x bar. And so in the same way, this freezes in uh, because you cannot kinematically produce particles uh, x uh, uh, any longer. Let's stick to the, first, uh, to the first hypothesis, which is easier. 
So you have, uh, if you want to do an estimate, uh, you have that uh, the yield that I defined before of the particle x, so the number density of the particle x divided by the, by the entropy density, will be given by something uh, like this. So the rate of uh, this process here, the rate of production of, uh, from standard model particles to, uh, to x particles, multiplied by uh, a Hubble time. So this is uh, the yield, the number density of particles that you produce in a Hubble time. The rate of the process times uh, the time that you have at disposal, the, the Hubble time, times uh, the density of uh, standard model particles uh, which are present, uh, right? So rate times time uh, times the number density of particles which are, hap which are uh, uh, subject to this decay here, divided by, this, by the entropy. So this is, uh, let's say that the rate uh, is uh, typically lambda squared times uh, a temperature. So the rate is uh, a quantity with mass, uh, with dimensions of a mass. And so typically, if you estimate uh, the, the, the rate for a process like this, you will get lambda squared, where lambda is the coupling that uh, is in the vertex, uh, times uh, a mass scale. And the only mass scale which is at disposal is uh, the temperature of the bath. So I'm putting here temperature of the bath. Times uh, Hubble time. So this is uh, M Planck divided by T cube, uh, T, T square roughly, so it's written somewhere, uh, well, possibly in the, in, the, in the other cosmology check uh, cheat list, times uh, a constant uh, times T3, which is the number density of the particles in the thermal bath, the standard model particles in the thermal bath, divided by a number times T3, another number times T3, which is uh, the definition of entropy, which I have here. So I'm forgetting all these constants here. So if, you, if I did think correctly, this comes out to be lambda squared times uh, M Planck divided by the temperature. So I'm saying that the yield of the particle X, due to this mechanism here, is inversely proportional to the temperature. So it's larger when the temperature is smaller. So basically it will happen mostly in this uh, final range uh, of temperature, just before, the, before freezing in. And so I can replace this uh, with, uh, and, so, and this temperature corresponds uh, to, the, uh, to the mass uh, of the particle uh, that I'm producing, uh, x. And so I'm, I'm, I can replace here the mass of the x particle. So I have that the, the yield of the particle x is uh, roughly lambda squared times M Planck divided by mass of x. And as I said before, I'm not very familiar with yield, so I better go into the usual omega x h squared, which is, uh, as you have seen many times now, which is uh, uh, redo the computations that I did uh, at some point uh, earlier, which is uh, mx entropy today divided by rho critical times the, the yield of uh, y times h squared. I mean, just, uh, just replace the, the typical definitions uh, for these quantities here. And so you get that these are all constants. Um, well, first uh, I have to replace uh, yx with this quantity here. So I have mx as 0 divided by rho critical lambda squared m Planck divided by mx h squared. So the mass also simplifies, like in the case of uh, freeze out. And what you have are just constants, all constants, things that I know very well. So it comes out to be 3 10 to the minus uh, 27 lambda squared. 
So the only physical parameter here is uh, lambda squared. Yeah? Because I'm saying that uh, the temperature at which uh, most of the production happens uh, is uh, as low as possible, and so around this time here, mm? around, around this time here. And what I said is that uh, this moment here is the one in which uh, the temperature of the thermal bath uh, is uh, becoming uh, smaller than the mass of the particle X that I want to produce, similar to the case of freeze out. So I don't have enough energy to produce the particle X and X bar. So this typically is the temperature that corresponds to the mass of the particle itself. I mean, I'm confusing a bit the two mechanisms, but roughly this comes out to be the correct uh, up estimate for the temperature. And the S0 was? S0 is the entropy, the entropy density to the today. Ah, yeah, so this, I'm just uh, doing it faster, but say omega is uh, rho dark matter divided by, by rho critical, uh, but mass times number density, number density is y times s, and there you are. So let me write it, uh, let me write it here, here. My final result in this case is that uh, omega dark matter h squared <coughs> is a number times uh, the coupling uh, squared. And this is the case of freezing. So you see that uh, in order to have omega dark matter squared equal to 0 0.1186, uh, so the observed abundance, uh, you have to have lambda of the order of uh, 10 to the minus 13, 10 to the minus 14. Mm -hmm. You plug in there and you get uh, 0 uh, 0.11. So a, a very small number, right? <coughs> so this coupling has to be very small. And you can uh, entertain uh, enormous amount of models in which this happens naturally, yeah? I don't understand. What do you understand? 10 to minus 27 it's plus 27. Yeah, it's plus 27. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, there's something, uh, yeah, it must be plus 27. I, mean, I think I made a mistake in the conversion, so I will check again. Yeah, because I have M Planck, which is 10 to the, M Planck, which is 10 to the 19. This is the, yeah, sorry, this is plus. Yeah, 13, 14, it depends. I mean, yeah, I mean, this is just a ballpark. Now, this is really sketchy. I mean, the, 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 this is hand waving. If you do the computations correctly, this number in front will be smaller or, or, or larger by maybe even an order of magnitude. You have to consider all the different processes. Uh, you have to immerse it in a specific particle physics model. But just to give, <coughs> that, just to give an idea, the the ballpark uh, is of the order of say 10 to the minus 13 14 or something like this <laughs> which is completely fine-tuned so you have to devise a mechanism uh, in particle physics in which you have uh, these processes uh, with this uh, small uh, small band with small uh, coupling uh, lambda <coughs> um, and then uh, yeah notice that uh, the dependence on the parameters is completely different from what I had before Right, so freeze out is that, asymmetric dark matter is that, and freeze in is something proportional to the, to the coupling lambda, and, uh, and so different properties of the particle physics involved. Okay, so uh, that's it for the production mechanism that I wanted to discuss. The next step would be to discuss uh, the say the ballpark of uh, masses and properties uh, for particle physics candidates, <coughs> for dark matter candidates from particle <coughs> physics, and actually not only. I'll, I'll uh, sketch that, and then uh, probably I will complete it next time, OK? Yeah. When should I stop? In 15 minutes, OK. I think I just want to sketch this, uh, because then I will uh, move on from this. OK, so what I want to do is to <coughs> write down here the range 
of uh, uh, masses of possible dark matter <coughs> candidates. So I go from uh, here to here. This is uh, roughly 10 to the minus uh, 21 electron volt. And this is uh, 10 to the 5 solar masses, which corresponds to, if I did the computations correctly, 5 uh, 10 to the uh, 70 electron volts. So basically what you have is that uh, there are roughly 91 orders of magnitude in which uh, dark matter could be. That goes from that small number to this uh, huge number here. And this is a, an actual illustration of uh, when I said at the beginning that uh, we, I don't know what I'm talking about. This is a good illustration of the point. Because uh, as uh, Rocky Kolb always says, uh, the hard work of thousands of theorists uh, for decades uh, has managed to restrict uh, the range of possible dark matter within uh, 92 orders of magnitude, 91, 92 orders of magnitude which is not very impressive. <coughs> anyway, this is where we are right now. So there are three regimes uh, in which uh, I want to, to, that I want to point out, uh, say more or less, let me put uh, here the Planck mass and Planck. And here let me put, uh, say, one electron volt, uh, just to fix the ideas. <laughs> and why I'm selecting these points? Uh, in this huge range? Well, essentially because uh, if you are above uh, Planck mass, uh, if you are considering candidates with a mass uh, that has, a which, which is larger than the Planck mass, uh, essentially you are talking about macroscopical object. Right? Because a, a particle with a mass larger than M Planck would have uh, a, um, a, a De Broglie wavelength, which is uh, the one of the Schwarzschild's radius, and so it essentially becomes a black hole, right? So this is essentially, if you want, the definition of the Planck mass. So here we are, we are talking about uh, not elementary particles, uh, but rather macroscopic objects. Here, instead, we are talking about uh, elementary particles. Well, elementary or not, but about uh, particles. And here we are talking about uh, ultra-light particles uh, that I can uh, actually better describe with uh, fields. For instance, uh, it's the case of ultralight uh, axions and these kind of things. So here it's not really a, a border. I mean, the, the, the tools uh, to describe this and this is always quantum field theory. But it makes sense uh, to define as particles of those that have uh, a De Broglie wavelength uh, uh, small enough, uh, and instead as fields, uh, those that have coherent fields, those that have uh, a De Broglie wavelength which is, uh, uh, which is large enough. <laughs> So what are the, cons the, the, the borders here, the, the extremes? Well, this extreme here is given by the fact, uh, let me use uh, maybe red, is given by the fact uh, that uh, a particle uh, with uh, a dark matter candidate with a mass uh, larger than this uh, would have uh, a mass uh, which is larger than the mass of a dwarf galaxy. Mm? I mentioned this when I was talking about uh, about uh, primordial black holes. So the typical mass of a dwarf uh, galaxy is, uh, say, 10 to the 5 solar masses. And uh, I cannot have uh, less than one particle per dwarf galaxy, one particle, quote unquote, of dark matter per dwarf galaxy. So I have to have uh, masses which are uh, lighter than that. The constraint here, instead, so dark matter has to be heavier than 10 to the minus 1 uh, uh, electron volt is actually has a similar origin in the sense that uh, <coughs> I want uh, the De Broglie wavelength uh, of this particle here to be larger than uh, the size uh, of a dwarf galaxy. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, I would have that uh, the, uh, the De Broglie wavelength uh, of the typical, say, dark matter particle is larger than the size of the object which is supposed to describe, and it, this doesn't make sense. I mean, uh, it would be a halo which is uh, bigger than the observed one uh, in a dwarf galaxy. Mm -hmm. 
So just to give you an idea, I'm imposing, so the De Broglie wavelength is uh, uh, 2 pi divided by the momentum, P. So 2 pi divided by mass of the dark matter times the velocity. <coughs> and I want this to be, uh, yeah, so the constraint is that lambda has to be smaller than the size of the dwarf, right? So this is the constraint. So this has to be smaller than the size of the dwarf, uh, which is, uh, say, 2 kiloparsecs, uh, just to give you an idea. You remember that the, the first day I gave some uh, scales. Uh, the Milky Way is possibly 50 kiloparsecs, uh, 20 kiloparsecs, sorry. The a dwarf is of the order of a few kiloparsecs, uh, say, 2. Dark matter particles move uh, with a velocity of the order of uh, 10 meters uh, per uh, 10 uh, kilometers per second in the in a typical dwarf and so what you get is that the mass must be larger than 2 pi divided by 2 kiloparsecs times v and this makes 10 to the minus 21 electron volt Okay. Otherwise, I could not uh, even identify a, a dark matter halo of a dwarf <coughs> uh, of a dwarf galaxy. Uh, <coughs> but, but the, so, how do you how do you define the velocity? So, if you have axons, for instance, how do you, are you sure that uh, they still move at this velocity? So, this comes. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, this is a uh, this is sort of. Um, uh, hand waving again, but uh, yeah. So the typical velocity of, of particles. Uh, so you, you can you can obtain it from numerical simulations, for instance. This is what you get. The typical values that you get. So for the case of uh, ultralight axions and so on, I don't know how exactly you extract the velocity, but um, let's say it has to be connected also to the typical rotational velocity of these galaxies here, because they both the dark matter and uh, the stars, the tracers, sit in the same gravitational potential. And that is observed to be a disorder of magnitude. So I would expect uh, more or less the same amount of uh, the same value. Mm. Now, the, the, the candidates that I, some of the candidates that I discussed in the past few days uh, find uh, their place uh, in this, uh, in this uh, diagram. So for instance, uh, around here, I have, uh, let's say here, I have a possible window for the primordial black holes. The two possible windows for the primordial black holes uh, that I discussed uh, last Friday. So this is uh, around <coughs> 10 to 100 uh, solar masses, the, the, the LIGO window. And this is the smaller mass window around 10 to the minus uh, 14 to 10 to the minus 9 solar masses where the, the lensing constraints uh, are not so important as we discussed uh, uh, this we discussed last time so there are other candidates that I can put on there are Planck relics so as a as a result of the evaporation of primordial black holes uh, they could end up being a large population of uh, so-called Planck relics uh, that I didn't discuss uh, uh, so far, but which are uh, a possibility. <laughs> and would have a mass around, uh, around uh, the, the Planck mass, of course. Then I can have uh, axions, typically QCD axions, which are here, which I'm not discussing, uh, maybe next time a little bit. <laughs> but in general, I have uh, all this window here, which is uh, OK for uh, uh, axion like uh, particles. So when you say axion, <coughs> you mean the QCD? And this one here, I mean the QCD axion, yes. Which typically points, uh, well, I mean, let's say, axions, uh, typically mo axion models point to a mass of uh, a microelectron volt or so, 10 to the minus 6 electron volts. But you can enlarge in a larger parameter space and look at smaller or larger masses and still uh, have uh, pro properties which are similar to the ones of axions. Then I have uh, <coughs> around the KV here, the case of uh, sterile neutrinos, which I might discuss a little bit uh, next time, or the next one again. And instead, around here, so from a GV <coughs> to, say, a PV, I have <coughs> the case of WIMPs that I basically discussed uh, 
today. So particles which are a thermal relic uh, from, uh, uh, from the early universe due to freeze out. Here you remember that uh, it's roughly the window for asymmetric dark matter, one of the possible windows for asymmetric dark matter. A few GVs, right? 5 to 10 or something like this. And all the rest is uh, open for, uh, for grabs. <coughs> so there are a few other things that I can say on this plot. The first one is uh, uh, the following. So um, if I go to very light particles, <coughs> I have the problem that if I want to reproduce, uh, so this side, uh, I have if I want to reproduce the, the abundance of dark matter, I have to pack a lot of them into, say, a galaxy, for instance. Right? If they're very light, uh, I have to put many of them uh, in order to produce uh, the sizable halo that we, that we observe. So there will be essentially a window, so a border, which turns out to be here, in which uh, dark matter can be only bosonic on this side and can be fermionic or bosonic on this other side. So as I was saying, if uh, they are very light, uh, I have to put uh, many of them packed in a galactic halo, and so they must be fermions. Otherwise, the Pauli, exclu Pauli exclusion principles uh, implies uh, that uh, you cannot put too many of them there. This is the so-called uh, gun remain bound. And it turns out that the value is of the order of, uh, say, mass uh, of fermionic dark matter has to be larger than 500 electron volt or something like this. <laughs> Let me sketch you how it comes out uh, <coughs> in, in two minutes. So if dark matter is fermionic, uh, is fermionic uh, consists, of, consists of a fermion, then uh, I have that the number density must be smaller than, uh, say, 2 divided by the unit volume. OK? Uh, because of value exclusive principle, right? You cannot put two, more than two fermions uh, uh, on top of each other, um, roughly speaking. So that means uh, that uh, the, number, the, the, the energy density must be smaller than uh, 2 times the mass uh, divided by the unit volume. And with the unit vo I express the unit volume as uh, the De Broglie wavelength of the particle, so lambda cube, where lambda is the De Broglie wavelength and is given again by 2 pi divided by mv. <coughs> so it's using there. OK? So I know that uh, typically in uh, a galaxy such as the Milky Way, this quantity rho is measured to be, and we'll discuss this next week, uh, is measured to be of the order of, say, 0.3 GV per centimeter cube. This is uh, the determination of the local dark matter energy density, say, around the Earth. It will be more towards the galactic center and less uh, towards the periphery, but let me put this as, a, as an indicative value. And so if you redo your algebra, you find that uh, I have that 2 n to the fourth uh, uh, velocity cube divided. So this was the volume, eh? and this instead is the velocity. Divided by 2 pi to the 3 has to be larger than this number here. And this gives you mass larger than about 500 electron volts. OK? So with five more minutes, uh, I can finish this. Is that OK? OK. Otherwise, I have to redraw everything, and it will be. So there are two other bounds that I want to discuss. There are two, two other bounds that, well, then another important thing, but this I already said, is that uh, around the same value, so roughly here, say, around 1 kilo electron volt, 1 kV, rather than uh, rather than 100 uh, GV here. There is another discriminant, which is the fact that uh, uh, below here, the dark matter would be hot or too warm if it is in thermal contact, while above here, 
the dark matter would be cold if it is in thermal contact. This I discussed uh, uh, last time. Mm. So if uh, your dark matter sits on this side of the, of the diagram, it cannot be produced uh, due to the thermal mechanism. Otherwise, it would be hot or warm, which is, uh, say, warm here and uh, hot as you go down, which, uh, which would be excluded by large-scale structure formation and by the CMB. <coughs> so this is another, typically at 1 kV, as I discussed last time, is the, is the, the frontier between the two, the two regimes. The WIMP, uh, the WIMP uh, uh, window is also constrained, uh, like, like rather, the thermal relic uh, dark matter window. So dark matter which is produced by annihilations from the early universe uh, due to the uh, freeze-out mechanism is also constrained to be uh, more or less in the same window here by two uh, kinds of, uh, of, of, um, of uh, arguments. The first one is the so-called unitarity bound that more or less uh, sits uh, here. That limits uh, your mass to be smaller than uh, about uh, 300 uh, TV. Mm. So one PV or something like this, 300 TV. How does it come about? Well, essentially, uh, it's very simple to understand. Uh, so uh, let me go back to the case uh, that I had in the case of freeze out. So the, the, the fact that uh, sigma v, as you remember, was roughly going uh, as g uh, to the 4 divided by 4 pi, uh, 1 over mass of the dark matter particle to the power 2. Now, I'm considering heavy dark matter, and so this is the matter mass that uh, enters uh, there. So remember that this was something <coughs> that I wrote uh, about, uh, about an hour ago. Mm. So as I was saying, you can play with G and M in such a way that you reproduce uh, the sigma V that you need, uh, which is uh, 3 10 to the minus uh, uh, 26 centimeter cube uh, per second. Mm. So this gives you the correct relic abundance. Uh, so you want this number to, to be this, uh, but you can reach it by heavy dark matter with a large coupling or light dark matter with a, light coup with a small coupling. You remember that, no? Now, the point is that uh, you cannot trust your theory if the coupling becomes uh, too large. So essentially, you have that uh, uh, G has to be limited uh, by, say, order 1 or so. Let's say G smaller than 4 pi. Otherwise, uh, your theory is completely meaningless uh, because you have a coupling which is... Uh, larger than unity, so you cannot compute anything. You cannot do computations of annihilation cross-sections, as I did. And that uh, translates uh, into mass of the dark matter to be smaller than uh, around uh, this value here. Let us just show. Okay, so it's very simple. Actually, the, the unitarity bound by itself is a bit more complex, so you should consider the different partial waves and whatever, but let's say the basic argument is the following. You cannot push the mass too high, otherwise uh, you would have to push the coupling too high to have the correct annihilation cross-section, and then uh, this uh, screws up uh, uh, perturbativity for your theory. Or if you want another way around, if you push the, ma push the mass uh, too high, if you still want the theory to be sensible, you would have uh, a very small uh, annihilation cross-section, which means uh, too much dark matter around, uh, and you contradict uh, the observation of cosmology. <laughs> and finally, there is another thing uh, which uh, limits uh, dark matter from this side, uh, if it is uh, uh, connected uh, to annihilations, uh, and in particular to, to the case of WIMPs, uh, which is the so-called Lee-Weinberg bound. which tells me the following. So this applies uh, to light dark matter that couples, uh, uh, that annihilates via the, the Z boson. Mm -hmm. So I'm, uh, I'm considering the diagram that I sketched before, light dark matter here, that annihilates, uh, say, into standard model fermions, uh, exchanging uh, a, a, a Z boson. Now, again, playing with the cross-section, this would be, sigma V would be 
you could estimate this to be constant uh, G Fermi squared mass of the dark matter particle divided by 2 pi. And in order to have this one uh, to the value that uh, you need from, uh, from cosmology, it turns out that the mass has to be larger than, uh, hopefully I don't make mistakes, uh, constants uh, G Fermi squared under square root. And this turns out to be 2 GV. OK, so this is telling me that uh, a toy wimp that uh, annihilates uh, with this value here has to be larger than about 2 GV. So the regime uh, for the windows uh, of, uh, of WIMPs uh, is more or less uh, framed uh, by the unitarity bound on one side and the Lee-Weinberg bound on the other side. It's not tight proof, it's not completely, because you could have other diagrams and, uh, and uh, th th this is just very sketchy. But roughly it's telling you the idea that uh, dark matter which interacts uh, with weak interactions and it's a thermal relic in the early universe must be heavier than a certain amount, otherwise you're running trouble due to that argument there. And I think uh, that's it. Yeah. Can the matter be bosonic uh, and uh, mass larger than that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. In that sense, absolutely. You can have a heavy scalar uh, with a mass of uh, 20 TV and nothing forbids that. Okay. It's just that. that uh, the arrow is, uh, for yes, the arrow here means that bosonic only on this side and the fermionic or bosonic on this side. It's not, uh, it's not necessary. Yeah, yeah, sure. So this is everything I'm going to say about uh, candidates. So essentially, I didn't say much about, apart from writing down their names there. I'm not talking about neutralinos. I'm not going to talk about... Uh, Kaluza uh, Klein dark matter or whatever, this would uh, more or less all sit here. I'm just showing uh, where the ballpark, the general ballpark car uh, is and uh, the different uh, bounds from one side and from the other. Next Friday, we'll go on uh, trying to finally detect dark matter. So with direct detection, indirect detection, and possibly also searches at uh, colliders. <coughs>